I want to, before we move away from the last presentation, <coughs> Luke 21 is simply another line upon these lines. And that's what we'll be doing for a few presentations, is we'll bring, be bringing another layer upon this repetition of history. So, in here, for me, what I put in my mind is the distress of nations that we talked about in Luke 21, in an agreement with the pioneer understanding and agreement with history, is identifying the problems in the Islamic world that were brought to the conclusion on August 11, 1840. Islam was restrained by the four great European powers at that time. When you understand that, when you understand that Luke 21 is marking that as one of the signs, then you have two witnesses um, to consider because on August 11, 1840, you also have the conclusion of the 391-year, 15-day time prophecy identifying how long Islam would bring warfare against Europe. So you've got two testimonies that this is a prophetic, um, it's been marked by prophecy. So, you know, I'm going to put I, R here, and, that, and not a very good R. But what I mean by R, I, R, maybe there's a better way you can express it for yourself if you're taking notes, is Islam is restrained. And that's what happened on August 11, 1840, Islam was restrained. And if you go into that history, it's very interesting to note that Egypt had the the, the financing and the power to take this war to Turkey. It had the strength to do it, but it did not have the manpower. It didn't have the foot soldiers to bring the war against Turkey. So it struck an alliance with a religious group in Saudi Arabia. And that religious group agreed to be the foot soldiers for the Egyptians as they went and reestablished an Islamic dynasty by conquering Turkey, who had been the Islamic dynasty for four centuries. That religious group that formed the alliance with Egypt to attack um, Turkey in that history is known as the Wahhabists. And Ben Laden and the Shiites that are doing uh, their work today are also the Wahhabi religion. It's, it's like the Wahhabi religion was restrained there. And then it all started all over again. So keep that in your mind. Maybe it will be. Uh, we'll try to tie it a little bit more as we proceed. You should mention that it is the most radical of all of the Islamic groups, Wahhabi. Yeah, and, and uh, we have a book written by a non adventist here, and there, I think there's only, as of last night, there was only three left, maybe they're all gone, that will really identify that the emphasis that we will be putting on Islam is accurate. Islamic terrorism. You can order one if we run out if you want one, because we're going to be handling them for quite some time. Now, I want to add something to I've been I've been telling you something over and over again. I hope I hope you learned it because I think it's correct. Here's what I hope you learn is that in each of these reform movements, there is a message formulated. William Miller is the man the Lord used to formulate the message of that hour. John the Baptist in his history, Moses in his history. The, their message goes through history for a while until it's empowered. And when it's empowered, you see a divine symbol come down out of heaven. Okay, the dove, uh, Michael and Daniel 10, Christ in Revelation 10, Christ in Revelation 18. It's marking the empowerment of that history. Um, but, that isn't all that it's marked. I, and, I, and I've been, I've been holding off purposely to make sure that you, you recognized the, the empowerment, the divine symbol. But now I want to go back into Revelation 10 and add another layer on this. In Revelation 10, and we've, we've mentioned this before, but I didn't put the emphasis on it that time, but I'm going to try to put on it this time. In Revelation 10, verse 1 through 7, you have the history of 1840 to 1844. Because when the angel comes down in, in verse 1 and onward and puts his foot upon the land and the sea, according to Sister White, that represents a worldwide message. And in 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. 
So Revelation 10 opens on August 11th, 1840, but by the time you get to verse 7 of Revelation 10, the seventh angel is beginning to sound, and the pioneers correctly understood and identified that the seventh angel of the seven trumpets, angels, began to sound on October 22nd, 1844. We will show you the pioneer logic in a further presentation if you're not familiar with that. Um, but it sounds, October 22nd, 1844 is when the, the seventh angel began to sound. Therefore, from verses 1 through 7 in Revelation 10, you have the history of 1840 to 1844. And then in verse 8, it says, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So what I'm saying is one, one of the truths that's in here that I have not mentioned before is that it's obvious that John takes the little book in 1840 and eats it because that's when the message became sweet for the Moonlights. That's when the year day principle was confirmed and what they've been teaching was verified. They were excited. Um, and the bitterness comes in 1844. But the eating of the little book in Bible prophecy marks the beginning of the testing time. In testimony 2 or 3, a thing is established. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 3, we will find Ezekiel eats a little book. And in Jeremiah 15, he eats a little book. And in Ezekiel 3, when the prophets eat the little book, when they eat the word of God, it is identifying that they have been given a message to carry to God's people and that it is a testing message. Um, look at verse 1 of Ezekiel 3. And remember that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, and also that when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he is illustrating the end of the world. And we know that. When, when, in Revelation 10, when John's eating the little book and it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach, Seventh-day Adventists understand that he's representing the Millerites at the end of the world. He's also representing the 144,000. So when we see a prophet become part of the prophecy, his actions are illustrating God's people at the end of the world. It's consistent with all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world when they're setting forth predictions. But in verse 1 it says, Ezekiel 3, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then I did eat, and it was in my mouth, but as honey for sweetness. Okay, uh, he's, this is a parallel passage to what John does. Because they're all speaking about the end of the world. And it's the same illustration. But notice, it, it adds meaning to what John is illustrating in Revelation 10, verse 5. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. He's eating the book, and he's going to be sent to that generation to give them a message that they will be tested. Verse 6, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou cannot understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee, but to the house of Israel, but the, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impotent and hard hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not. Neither be dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears. Um, drop down to verse 16, just to add one more component to this. What's the chapter? Chapter 3 of Ezekiel. Um, verse 16 says, And it came to the pass at the end of seven days, 
that the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth, and give them warning for me. So when a prophet takes God's word and he eats it, it's marking not only the empowerment of a message, but it's marking that a that the people of that generation are to be tested at that point in time over the message of prophecy that's being delivered to them. And at the same time, verse 17 is telling us that those people that are presenting that message are watchmen. Okay? And so when we understand that John in Revelation 10 is representing the Millerite movement, and that's how we understand it, we understand, I understand, he's also representing 144,000 because that history is repeated. But just keeping it at the Millerite level, in Revelation 10, when John is eating the little book, he's not only identifying when the message is empowered, in other words, message is empowered, he's identifying that a testing process is being brought to the Millerite, and that he is representing the watchman of that time. Now the passage, the passage um, that um, the Millerites were led to in order to produce that chart is Habakkuk chapter 2. And you'll notice in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 it says, And I will, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come and will not tarry. So this passage that directed the Millerites to produce the chart, <coughs> they're on the watchtower. Those, those people that were producing the chart were the watchmen of the Millerite history. You can see that, verse 1. You with me? And I'll try to pull this logic together. So when John in Revelation 10 is eating the little book, not only marking the empowerment of the message, but he's marking the, the beginning of a testing process. And this is the testing process that Sister White, we started the first night. And that the handout we have has this passage from early writings, page 259, where she, she compares the history of Christ she says, all those that would not receive the message of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. And by their rejection and crucifixion of Jesus, they said, so dark in their understanding that they could see no place, uh, no way into the heavenly sanctuary. And the Jews were left in total darkness. She, she describes the testing process here in the time of Christ. And then in the next paragraph, she compares it to the testing time in the Millerites from 1840 to 1844 which was progressive. Those people that rejected the first angel's message weren't around to be tested by the second angel. Those people that flunked the test of the second angel's message weren't around for the midnight cry. Progressive testing process. And when John eats the little book, by the fact, and I didn't go to Jeremiah 15, put that in your notes, you read Jeremiah 15, you will see that he eats the word of God as well, and he is also then taking a message to God's people and and prepared that God's people are not going to receive it. It's a shaking. All right? it's, it's illustrated as shaking, like we just read in Ezekiel 3. When the prophet eats a little book, he's given a message that causes a shaking, testing time among that generation, but he's also a watchman. And we know that the Millerites, those that were being used by the Lord in the Millerite history, were the watchmen because it's the watchmen here in Habakkuk that prepare this chart. All right? Okay. We go. I'm sorry that I can't give you a little better understanding of where we're going, but we're going to jump now, and we'll come back to all this in, within 15 minutes, I hope. Um, okay. Uh, I want to read one quote. We'll go to Isaiah 22. If you want to go to Isaiah 22, I will catch up with you um, as soon as I get this one close. Isaiah 22. Isaiah 22. Isaiah 22. <clears throat> Here's what I want to remind us of. <clears throat> We've mentioned it more than once here. Sister White says, 
I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were taught with wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. It's the Review and Herald, August 19th, 1890. In this history, from 1840 to 1844, Sister White identifies in a great controversy that the history of the Millerites fulfilled the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter. When this history is repeated in the history of the 144,000, the parable of the ten virgins will be repeated again to the very letter. The parable of the ten virgins, in Great Converse, in page 393, Sister White says, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. This is our parable. And in the parable, there is a crisis at midnight, and Sister White talks about this from time to time. The crisis at midnight is where we will demonstrate the character that we prepared in our previous hours of probation. And in Review and Herald, October 17, 1895, this is one of the places where she comments on it. It's not the only place concerning the crisis, and that's what I want you to focus on for a moment. She says, character is revealed by a crisis. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. The sleeping virgins roused from their slumbers, and it was seen who had made preparation for event, for the event. <clears throat> Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other found without preparation. Character is revealed by circumstances. Next paragraph, I skip some. It says, testing time comes to all. So, my point is that, the, the door in the parable for the Millerites closes on October 22nd, 1844. This is their, this is their, their final test. This is their flunker, tell, flunker pass test. It's been a progressive test. Since John eats the little book from 1840, how are you going to relate to the first angel's message? How are you going to relate to the denominations when they close the door? How do you relate to the midnight cry? But when you get to October 22nd, 1844, you either stay in the holy place and you end up praying to Satan or you move into the most holy place with Christ. There's the, the line in the sand. When that event is repeated by Adventism at the end of the world, it'll be at the Sunday Law. Because at the Sunday Law, all those that have understanding of Sabbath for Sunday will demonstrate what character they prepared in their previous hours of probation and Seventh-day Adventists will be without excuse will either demonstrate a character or prepare to see the God of the Lord of Peace. So, in both our histories, we have a text where the door closes that is the crisis where we demonstrate character. In Isaiah 22, we will have to fly. <clears throat> Isaiah 22 is a chapter dealing with Adventism. Um, it's dealing with the history when Sennacherib was coming to conquer Jerusalem. And there are two people in this story. Shebna, who is the treasurer, who is the leader over the house. And, um, and the Eliakim, um, which is the son of Hilkiah. And, uh, and Eliakim is the faithful servant during this crisis. Shebna is the unfaithful. Eliakim is the faithful one. And you can demonstrate that Shebna is the Laodicean church, and Eliakim is the Philadelphia church. And the pioneers of Adventism correctly understood that in this history, you had three churches that were active. Laodicea, Philadelphia, and Sardis. In this history, they understood that those people that were in the Millerite movement, that were faithful to the Millerite myths, that were genuinely faithful, <laughs> were the Philadelphians. But there were people in the Millerite movement that weren't genuinely faithful. They were the Laodiceans. But the message the Millerites were giving was to the Sardis people outside of the Millerite movement. All three churches were active in their mind, and it's, it will be repeated with us. There will be weak tares, wise and foolish virgins, and Adventism. There will be Philadelphians and Laodiceans. And what we will do is we're going to give the message to Sardis about the 11th hour workers. So you can see these three contemporary churches in both these histories as the parable of the ten virgins is fulfilled. And Isaiah 22 is speaking to both the Millerite history and to our history. And in, let's go very quickly um, to verse 1. The burden of the valley of vision. We could spend some time there on vision. Because where there is no vision, the people perish. You can, you can factor that into what's going on today and what was going on in the Millerite time period. This is speaking to Jerusalem. 
God's people says, What aileth thee now thou art, that thou art wholly gone up to the house tops? In that history, what was it that took the people up to the tops of the houses? They went up to the top of their houses to worship the sun and the moon and the stars. Spiritually, false worship. Okay? Thou art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. All thy rulers have fled together, they are bound by the archers. All that are bound in thee are bound together, which have fled from afar. Therefore said, Look away from me, I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. This is Isaiah's people, and in Bible prophecy, a daughter is the is the offspring, or as we would say in Habits and Seasons and Remnant. For it is a day of trouble, verse 5, of treading down, and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls. The walls, Sister White, how this represents the law of God, and crying to the mountains. And I'm skipping over a lot of symbols to try to make just one point. And Elam bare the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kur uncovered the shield. And it shall come to pass that the choicest valley shall be made full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah, that thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. Now what's being described here is that Jerusalem is in a crisis. Sennacherib is coming to destroy Jerusalem. And this is Isaiah's commentary on what's going on in Jerusalem at this time. And in verse 8, he discovers the covering of Judah. Um, what what they're using for their protection. Verse 9, you have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many, and you gather together the waters of the lower pool, and you have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have you broken down to fortify the wall. You've made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But, but, you have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto them to him that fashioned it long ago. In the crisis, they're not looking to God, they're looking to their self. They're counting the houses, they're counting the baptisms, uh, they're looking at the churches, they're looking at the institutions. And the king of the north is about to sweep it all away. They're not looking to God. But notice verse 12, it says, and in that day, in this crisis day, that is representing, because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, it's representing this crisis in the Millerite history and this crisis today that we're living in in Adventism. And in that day did the Lord God of call, hosts call for weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Brothers and sisters, every seventh day Adventists should be able to take that verse and identify what day is under discussion. What day are we called to be weeping and mourning and in sackcloth? The Day of Atonement. And Adventism is living in the antitypical Day of Atonement. So this, this passage is speaking about here and now. The next verse. In spite of the fact that we've been told to be weeping and mourning, the next verse says, And behold, joy and gladness, slaying of oxen and killing of sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. We're celebrating when we should be mourning and in sackcloth. At the world, Saul the prophet is speaking about the end of the world. And notice verse 14. It says, And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, saying, Lord of hosts, surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord of hosts. And if you look up, the meaning of shall not be purged for you in the Hebrew, you know how you would read it in the Hebrew? Surely you shall not find any atonement for this sin. It's as if we're talking about the Day of Atonement. We're pardoned during the Day of Atonement when we should be preparing for a crisis. That's the setting of this um, testimony. So now we've reached to where we can look at the two, the two men that are being used as symbols. Verse 15, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasure, unto Shephna. Boy, the, the treasures, Bible history, they get, it's not a very good symbol, is it? You've got Shephna, you've got Judas, you've got Tobiah, right here. This part of the sanctuary that Nehemiah has to uh, kick out. And Shevna is the person here that's that's getting the bad reviews of this passage. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go get thee unto this treasure, even to Shevna, which is over the house, in the leadership position, and say, What hast thou here, and whom that hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out of 
sepulcher on high, and that and that graveth the habitation for himself in a rock. Shebna, instead of preparing for the crisis, he was making himself a fancy grave. And you know what? They actually discovered Shebna's grave, and it's in uh, a museum in London. They actually they've got the, the stone that he was making with his name and his seal on it. It blew my mind. I was looking in the Adventist dictionary to look up on Shebna. That's a fact if you have the dictionary. But you know what else is a fact? They actually found um, Eliakim's seal as well. They're both. Of all the people in the Bible that have, you know, a, a geographical um, something they found to confirm that they existed, both of these men mm-hmm. have artifacts identifying them. And Eliakim, what they found was a seal. Whereas Shebna, he's afraid. Uh, but verse 16, he's speaking about he's, he's building a grave in Christ's time. And then verse 17, Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. He will surely, surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And Shebna is representing the way of the scenes that are screaming out of the mouth of the Lord. It's cast out. That's never seen. And the reason I say that, there's two classes in this passage, and it's clearly the Day of Atonement. Now notice the other class in Eliakim. Still, verse 19, And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day, in this crisis in Adventism, that I will call my ser- servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now notice. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so that he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. This phrase is only found one other place in God's word. In the Philadelphian church, the life came to sit with Philadelphia, both in the Millerite time period and in our time period. The life came to sit representing the faithful, the wise virgins during the crisis. Right? Verse 23 And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring, and the issue, all the vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cup, even to all the vessels of flag. It's in that day, all the ornaments of the sanctuary are going to be hung upon this person as he glorifies his father in the crisis that confronts the world at the end. And verse 25 says, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and cut down and fall. And the burden that is upon it shall be cut off for the Lord God has spoken. And that day, when the crisis concludes, probation will close. But here's what I would like you to see. We, have, we used up all our time. As those of you get out of here at 8.30, we used up all our time. I wanted to get to one place in this presentation, and we just got to that place. And now I have to tell you where we're at and try to bring this to a conclusion. Chapter 22 of Isaiah is identifying the crisis for God's people at the end of the world. It's identifying October 22nd, 1844 for the Millerites. It's identifying the Sunday law for you and I. But you know what comes before the Sunday law? And this is an important point in our study as we proceed. What comes before the Sunday law, according to Bible prophecy, is chapter 21. Because there was watchmen in the Millerite history, and there will be watchmen in the time period of the 144,000. And in Isaiah 21, it identifies what the watchmen will recognize before the crisis. And the crisis for the Millerites was October 22, 1844. And the crisis for us is the Sunday law, but the watchmen will recognize something before the crisis and it's Isaiah 21. Let's go through this with enlightening speed. I'm going to run a little bit over. Okay. All right. Verse 1. The burden of the desert of the sea, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. <clears throat> What's desert? 
A, gre a grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O man, besiege O me, that all the sign thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pains have taken hold upon me as the pains of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted, fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath determined to fear unto me. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower. Eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus saith the Lord, for thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. The Millerites declared what they saw, represented on that chart. We will declare what we see. It. Before chapter 22, before the crisis of the Sunday dawn, the watchmen in Adventism will declare what they see, just as the watchmen of the Millerite declared what they saw. Okay. Now, in verse 7, and he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen. How many horsemen? Two. Okay. A chariot of asses. By the way, this word is translated asses. It's the wild Arabian ass. And the people that go across the Arabian desert they, with their camels, they use this ass to go with them to confront because it can smell water. You can be in the desert if you've got the wild Arabian ass. That's what he can do. He can take you to water when no one else can find it. And the wild Arabian ass here, it's, if you go to Genesis 16, 12, we've looked at this before, but I want to point it out to you. What is it? Genesis 16, 12. Uh, in the prophecy about Ishmael, it says that he will be a wild man. This word translated mm -hmm. wild. Is this wild Arabian ass? Ass, donkey, uh, it's from the family of the horse. And since the long Bible prophecy, is the horse. So if we go back to Isaiah 21, in verse 7, it says, And he saw a chariot with a horseman, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. What, what, what would camels symbolize the Bible prophecy? The wild Arabian donkey and the camel is a symbol of Islam. And there's two horsemen. And if you don't think the Millerites recognized two horsemen that represented Islam, all you have to do is look over in the 1843 chart in the lower right hand corner and you'll see two horsemen. The one symbolizes the fifth trumpet, the first bow, and the other represents the sixth trumpet, the second bow, and it was both Islam and the watchman of the Millerite time period identified the role of Islam in Bible prophecy before the crisis arrived, arose. In verse 7 it says, And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, asses, a chariot of camels, and he hearkened diligently with much heat, and he cried, A lion, my lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my word whole nights, and behold, here cometh the chariot of horsemen, and a couple of a chariot of men and a couple, with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken down into the ground. Brothers and sisters, the message of the Millerites was Babylon is fallen. But first, they saw it is fallen. First, that's our message too. Our message is Babylon is fallen. And in verse 10, it says, Oh, my threshing in the corner of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you the burden of Duma. He calleth to me out of Seir. Now, just take notes for this if you want to check it. Look in 32 3, and you will see that Seir is a descendant of Ishmael. This is Islam. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night, if you will inquire. Inquire ye, return, come. The burden upon Arabia, which is a symbol of Islam. In the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, O you traveling companies, companies of dividends. The inhabitants of the land of Tima, look at Genesis 25 15, you see Tima, the descendant of Ishmael. The inhabitants of the land of Tima brought water to him that was thirsty to prevent him. With their bread, him that fled, for they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. The role of Islam in Bible prophecy is to anger the nations, to distress the nations, to bring war. It produces the Sunday law, the end time, the next century, and the world of The role of Islam, as identified by the power of pioneers, and the founder.
foundational understanding of Adventism. For thus has said, for thus hath the Lord said unto me, within a year, according to the years of a hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fell, shall fell, Genesis 25, 13, once again, the descendant of Ishmael. And the residue of the number of the archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished, won't be removed, it's going to be restrained. Because, brothers and sisters, in the Millerite history, when the watchmen of the Millerite history accomplished their work, they first identified the role of Islam, not first, they identified the role of Islam before the crisis arrived. And that history will be repeated. And before the Sunday law arrives to planet Earth, the watchmen in Adventism are going to identify the role of Islam in Bible prophecy as they parallel and repeat the Nephite history. And Islam began to fulfill its prophetic role on September 11, 2001, when the third woe arrived in history. And the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. And brothers and sisters, we'll start focusing in on that again. But I want you to see that when it comes to the testimony of the watchmen and the work that they accomplished, both in the Millerite movement and in the 144,000, Isaiah 21 and 22 tell us that before the crisis comes, the watchmen in God's church are going to understand the role of Islam. And the Father, forgive me for going so quickly over such sacred information. But we need to be minute men in some respects at this time in this history. Time is short. We've been sleeping far too long. We can get up on the wall, understand this message, and pass it along. Satan has been allowed to bring death and destruction down and have that increase in pace and their souls to be won. Thank you for being with us so far this week. We ask for your continued presence. We ask you to take us home safely during this travel and nurse us and give us rest. Thank you for the easy times that we have to consider these things. Thank <laughs> you.